So I want to walk through these five keys that you have to building trust. And you start with understanding. Why is that the starting yeah. point? Well, it is the basic, basic, basic um, deepest need of a human being is we trust somebody when we feel like they understand me and my needs. Okay, I, um, I've got a book coming out on this um, in the spring, and and there's an uh, example in there um, where if you're if you're an FBI hostage negotiator. I remember I was actually talking about this in a leadership conference and, and afterwards the guy walked up to me and said, I'm the lead, I'm the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI and everything you just said is our program. Okay. So you're a hostage negotiator. A guy's got a bomb strapped to him in a bank. He's got 50 hostages in there. You don't go in there as a negotiator. You don't go in there and say, dude, this is stupid. Now, let me tell you, if you, I mean, this is a mess. You're going to blow your, are you, and you don't persuade him out of this. See, that's what leaders do. What they do is instead the negotiator goes in and says, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm George. And, um, they sent me in here to to talk to you and, um, tell me your name. Says the name. And so how do we get here today? What's going on? How do we find ourselves here? And they start to pull out the story. Now, as they're pulling out the story, if the negotiator knows how to make the guy feel understood, like he's really getting his dilemma and why this is his only option and how he got to this point, that's going to begin to let the system relax a little bit. And that's just the first step. You know, if I go into, um, I just had two knee replacements in the past year. And if I, if I go into the surgeon and said, yeah, I saw your MRI, you know, you got bone on bone and, and it's not going to be a problem. We'll replace this thing and, and blah, blah, blah. I'm going, okay. But what if I go into the second one? He says, dude, how are you, how are you even walking? I looked at your, I looked at your MRI. Tell me about it. Is this thing hurt all the time? Or, and you're trying to understand. And then the second, in the second uh, example, you're starting to get a feeling that this guy really understands how bad this is for me. And so he or she knows what my needs are. Now, when a team, for example, when they start, when you feel like somebody on the other side of the table understands how their work and their behavior and everything they're doing impacts you and either slows you down or makes it more difficult or helps you win. When they have your needs really understood in their head, then trust really begins to, you know, to, to mount. When, when a leader stands up there and just tells everybody what to do and sends them out and this, that, and the other, and they don't feel like that he or she gets it, what it's like going to be like to have to pull that off and everything is going to, they don't understand, you're dust. You're yeah. dust. Well, and it takes a level of patience too. Most leaders, they're probably in a rush. They're not really slowing down. I mean, even your pacing when you were asking those questions, it was a slow, patient steady. There wasn't this element of what's going on. Okay. Well, I got, I got a lot going on. So I need you to, you know, figure this out and get out of the room. There is a level of patience that every leader needs to slow down to help understand their team. Oh yeah. I remember a merger situation I was consulting with one time where two companies came together and the new CEO stood up and cast a vision. Energy was high in the room and all that. And then, then a lady says, yeah, well, you know, uh, We've got a product line. I've got 3,000 people that report to me, and we poured all our resources into this. I've moved people across the country, and the other company has got exactly the same same product. My people are worried, sick, what's going to happen to us? And he goes, well, it's not going to be a problem, because then he explains to her why she doesn't have to worry. Right? Well, you can see the light. He's lost. The, the lights are dimming in her eyes, and and she's, she's nodding, but I'm going, dude, you have just missed it. We walked out and he said, wasn't that great? I said, no, it's like the worst thing I've ever seen. You, you, you totally invalidated everything that they were trying to tell you. He goes, no, I didn't. I said, shut up. You're doing it to me right now. He wasn't understanding what they were trying to tell him. Now, he didn't have to agree with it that it was going to be impossible, 
But you understand when somebody, not when you understand them, but when they understand that you understand. So if he had just said, gosh, 3,000 people worried about their jobs, what is that like? I mean, what is your, I can't imagine what your inbox looks like. What are they telling you? And how are you dealing with, with all those? I mean, and just kind of, so she feels like he really gets how hard this thing is going to be. Now we're going to follow him to his answer, but not if he doesn't understand. Yeah. Big and deal. you got to care. That's good. So after we've gone through this understanding phase, another key is knowing intent. And so this come is this come down to motive? Yeah, it actually is motive. You know, we trust somebody when we feel like that that they have a motive that's not just about them, that they also are motivated, they have an intent to, I call it, you know, the simple phrase of grace is unmerited favor, that, that they have favor for you. They're looking out for you and your interests, not only their own, and they're going to protect you even when you're not at the table. That's real trust. When we know that somebody's really, their motive is not just about themselves. You've been on a team where where some people, it's kind of all about their little corner and their little silo and their own performance and this and the other. They're not looking out to help the team win or help the bigger vision win. It's kind of all about them. You know, back, back to the surgeon. Yeah, I understand your... God, that pain has got to be so bad. How do you? And now I'm trusting. He says, okay, can I do your surgery? And you go, sure. And then he goes, well, that's great. Now now you, you've got insurance, right? You, you're going to be able to pay, pay, pay my bill. And, and and by the way, I got a golf game coming up. So here, you go. Uh, Susie, can you take care of him? Or Joey, can you schedule this guy? I got to go, dude. And make sure they pay. And then he's out of the room. Well, we know who this surgery practice is about. Now, sure, the guy's got to get paid, but what if, what if he said, "You know what? I this thing is this thing is bad." Didn't I see you out in the waiting room? Who was that kid with you? Well, it was my, you know, my son or daughter or grandson or whoever. And he says, he says, "Look, I want you to be able to." I saw you, Stone. I want you to be able to go play with your kid. We got to get you back out on the golf course. And this is going to be hard surgery and hard decision for you to make. But I want a good 25 years for you. Come on. we got. And he starts to where you feel like he's not just in it for himself or herself. Mm. And, and, and when leaders, when everybody feels like, or anybody on a team, they're trying to do everything kind of like, you know, something that's good for them. It's like walking onto a used car lot. I mean, there's just a difference when we feel like somebody wants us to do well. They want us to win. And you see behaviors that actually show that. And here's the bottom line. They've got your back. They're looking out for you when you can't see the enemy. They're guarding you. And that makes us be careless with somebody. 